I can relate okay. to that. Uh, so welcome uh, to another Better World interview. Um, we're here today with Claire Goodwin, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. So take it away. Thanks. So my name is Claire Goodwin. I work in occupational safety and risk management uh, in the Western United States. I work for government. And my background really is uh, heavily in occupational safety, uh, risk management, more in hazard and operational risk management. And, you know, it's a field where there's a lot of certifications. The one I currently hold is certified safety professional, and I'm pursuing my associates in risk management designation. So what, what does hazard operational risk management mean? So what that is, is the hazard with actually doing the work. So what we look at is safety. Uh, ergonomics, security, uh, emergency preparedness, those are all occupational health. Those are all components of the hazard aspect of risk management. In enterprise risk management, the risk director really is responsible for touching on hazard, operational, financial, and strategic risk. The place I work at is a little bit more old school in how they do things. Um, there's a real big range in how you do risk management. One end is you buy insurance um, and that's it. And then the other end is that enterprise risk management where you're involved in everything. And even if you're not, you definitely are not in charge of everything, but you facilitate those discussions and make sure that all of those risks have been addressed within their respective groups and that they align with what your organization has decided is, is risk tolerance. So safety very much falls into that hazard risk. And a lot of what I do is hazard risk and a little bit of operational risk. Okay. And so how did you how did you get into this uh, this profession or this field like what what brought you into the risk management uh, field I guess. Well originally I wanted to be a doctor I didn't get to med school, but I really <laughs> liked um, environmental health and safety is that world and you know there that is a big field and as you progress through it you you really narrow down into where you want to work are you going to do environmental health which is how does your environment affect your health so there's a lot to that you know there's a lot of social justice work involved in environmental health there's a lot of um, geology ground remediation involved in environmental health there's a lot of air quality testing in that and then with occupational health so the safety part of that is really how what is your work doing to you do you have a safe workplace you know is the noise okay is the ergonomics okay so i found that appealing as somebody who wanted to go into medicine and when <laughs> i got a couple of c's and that's not good for getting in but you know the running joke is i come from a medical family as uh with my parents is i like to deny them patients and they're perfectly good with that so it, it met that need of being able to help people but very much on that preventative side is how do we keep you from ever needing you know, that care or to utilize that system. Um, how do we identify and respond to these things before they happen? And if they do happen, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Let, let me reassure you that if you ever decide you want to go into law, you can absolutely have uh, C's on your transcript and still get into a very good law school. Ask me how I know. <laughs> I had a civil engineer who's like, C's are bad. And I'm like, you're designing our major infrastructure system, dude. Don't tell me that. <laughs> so, so can you tell us a little bit about how your work interacts with uh, the legal system and the legal profession? So we do quite a bit of work with our attorney's office. So, you know, the government organization I work for has an attorney's office and quite a few attorneys in there. And where we overlap is with employment law and then also you know, any governmental immunity requests or if we have lawsuits against the city. So, you know, with the employment law, we are a little unusual in this place I work is, oh, not will state, but where I work is, you know, you have classified employees. And once you get through your probationary period, you just can't fire people. It has to be with cause. So in working with the attorneys is, you know, really, do we have what's in place um, that's necessary if we have somebody who's just flagrantly violating safety rules and has gone through coaching and has gone through, you know, corrective actions? Are we, are we where we need to be? And then also within the work comp, workers' compensation world, so for people who've been injured and need care through uh, their employment, 
are we doing everything we can for them? So if we have situations and we have uh, law enforcement officers within our organization, if we have somebody who's so badly hurt that they can no longer do the essential functions of their job, you know, working with the employment attorneys on, you know, what are our next steps? What does it look like? How do we accommodate this person if he really is at what we call MMI, which is maximum medical improvement, mm -hmm. and he cannot perform those functions? what are the next steps? So that's one avenue. And then if we have situations where somebody who's suing the city or sorry, uh, suing the organization and we determine that it's with cause, you know, how do we, how do we get through that? Uh, are we gonna go through mediation if somebody is suing the organization? We're not entirely sure it's, you know, uh, legitimate. What is our research? What are we doing? How do we determine whether or not we want to settle this or if we want to fight it in court? And then, you know, with the Governmental Immunity Act is where have we waived that? Where have we not? What does that look like? Our, where we spent a lot of time with the attorney's office recently is <laughs> with the uh, economic downturn, the insurance world is very hard hit. And when we have somebody who has run into our property and damage is to say a light pole, which are really expensive. They're like $100,000, <laughs> which I didn't realize, you know, in the past, what we've done is say, hey, you know, you've damaged this. And this is something that has a 50 year lifespan. And we really 20 years into it didn't anticipate having to cover this cost. We want more than what its actual value is. And we want more of a replacement or repair value. And in the past, we'd kind of gotten away with that if we were willing to take it to court now, not a chance. So, you know, we've had to go in and really find interpretations of law in terms of, can we ask for a replacement value or are we stuck with, you know, the actual value of the property at the time of the damage? And for us, the finding was that that's really gonna be, you know, that actual value is what you're getting. So now our struggle is within the budget. How do we, so with that light pole, um, we're gonna get $60,000 back. We have a gap of 40,000. How do we, how do we pay for that? And where does that come from? So, you know, there's a lot of interpretation of the law. How do we pursue people who've injured the organization, but also how do we respond to people the organization is injured and is what they want proportional. And then we also just have small things like people get mad if we damage the grass, you know, it, much smaller things than, right. you know, accidents. But <laughs> so, and you know, there's a big overlap there. And I think that's a really important uh, piece of the puzzle that um, that governments aren't just defendants in these lawsuits. They can be plaintiffs as well. They can be the injured party. And then governments are going through sort of the dispute generation process, right? That, that um, now I'm really getting, getting into my nerd stuff, right? The, the, the Felstener and Surratt. Uh, dispute generation process, the the naming, blaming, and claiming, right? The, oh, yes, we have been harmed here. And, you know, blaming is, you know, oh, we can actually point it at the person that's responsible. And then the claiming, you know, is is making the demand of we want, we want to be, to be paid for this. And I think that that's something that is uh, important for folks who are sort of on the outside that governments go through that process too. Um, and I think that's a really helpful and, and important insight for you to, to give us that, um, that uh, we're all sort of engaged in the same decision process. We're not necessarily using the same factors, right? For individuals, I think it may be sometimes a more emotional process than we hope it is for our governments. But I really, I, I think that this is really important. Um, so with that in mind, right, would you, would you feel comfortable maybe um, uh, expanding a little bit on the uh, thinking that goes into uh, dispute generation and dispute resolution? So that is an area of improvement for us. And really the reason for that is we have really existed with the same risk program um, for the last 20 or so years. And what we're finding now is we need a much more consistent system on how we approach these. You know, what is always a challenge, which what is never a challenge and really um, reduce that discretionary gray area for us. What in terms of, you know, property damage, 
if there is a possibility that we can collect, we will. There, and this is where it gets very informal, if we have a situation where somebody who is uninsured causes $10,000 worth of damage to our property, and there's really no prospect of recovering that, it may be that we decide that it's in no one's interest to go to a court and, you know, slap a hundred dollars a month on someone's paycheck to get this back over however long that's going to take. So, but that's very informal currently. That is something that we need to work on. And, you know, in my current role as the head of our program, I've only been here about a year. <laughs> it's been an exciting year. So it hasn't left much time for really figuring out in creating these procedures and policies and ultimately whatever we create has to go through the leadership and the organization to determine if this is what we want to do. If you're and, insured- And of course, and of course, because you're government, there are, you know, there are democratic responsiveness impulses, you know, issues yes. that, that come into play where you're, respon you're, you're ultimately responsible to elected officials yes. who have constituency concerns that may not match up with sort of uh, the, the perfect analysis of what, yeah. what the city should, should be doing in a rational world. Yeah, and you know, I think if you're clever and you're really, you pay attention to what your elected officials were voted in on and what their interests are, and they'll, they'll let you know, um, is how do you align with those? So right now, equity and inclusion is a really big one. And for us, that's that actually lines up nicely because in the past what's happened is the people who you know have claims against the organization and have the time to sit there and just be persistent um, in the most obnoxious way that takes up a ton of time tended to actually get what they wanted more than the person who's like hey you did the exact same you know they don't know about this but it's the exact same thing but I'm really nice and I have a job and, you know, I'm a single mom and I don't have the time to pursue this. So what, you know, going back and looking at some of the settlements we had, they really favored wealthier, older white men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for equity and inclusion for us, that was great because that really is something that we can go, this is why we want this is so that everybody gets the same response. If it's no, it's no, but there's no chance we're going to say no to this single mother who may be a person of color and yes to this person over here who's, you know, got the time and money and privilege to be able to pester everyone and call the powers to be because at some point in their, you know, 60 years working in the community, they've met these people, you know, we need to make that much more consistent and as fair as you can. So that's, you know, there, there are opportunities in there if you look and if you can be creative. Uh, safety is absolutely one of those things that you get very creative on what you tie your work to. I used to work in healthcare and they weren't super worried about injuring their employees, but they were very worried about injuring their patients. And when we pointed out that an injured worker is far more likely to commit, you know, one of Medicaid and Medicare CMS's um, never events, they went, oh, perhaps we shall invest in this. So it's, there's a lot, you really want to be creative. And the people who support you quite a bit on that is the legal department, because they know what the rules are, they know what the laws are, you know, they know overall, you know, what the city can get dinged on. So quite a bit of what we do, we do talk to them and we do, you know, say, these are our priorities, this is what we're looking at is there any overlap? And quite often there is. So when we do our budget offers, um, when we look at programs and development, we, we coordinate quite a bit with legal just to make sure that if there's any overlap and we can have that support, we utilize that. Great, no. So can you just talk a little bit about what the things are that like get you motivated to go to work? I mean, if they didn't, they didn't, uh, if, it, if it was so perfect, they wouldn't have to pay us to do it. So on the, on the hard days, what, what gets you excited about what you're doing? I, and like I said in the intro, I spent a lot of time in safety, occupational safety. So that really motivates me. And I have the privilege of working for an organization that really genuinely cares about its employees. That's one of its selling points. You work for the government, so you're not getting paid a lot of money, but we really want to take care of you. And one of the ways they do that is through work, um, safety, and just trying to figure out, can we get you the equipment? Can we get you the training? So being able to connect with people and you know, developing those relationships and getting that trust. Uh, ultimately, safety doesn't work if people don't tell you what's happening. So, you know, developing that relationship and 
establishing that trust, uh, establishing that communication and having people bring you their concerns. And sometimes people, you know, either they didn't have the best experience where you are, but more often they're carrying, you know, sort of emotional baggage from their old employers. Like you never talk to safety. It's all a crock of whatever. Um, it's just the government trying to charge you money. And then you get them into this culture when you can show them and prove to them to their satisfaction that you really do value it. It's not a punitive culture and they come and talk to you. That's really motivating for me is, you know, figuring out how do we do this? How do we change this? And then having the people who do the work involved in it, you know, giving them their say, because ultimately the people who are doing the work know their job the best, you know, and this is also another fun thing about what I do is I get to figure out what people do. So I get to hang out with them, where they do their work. Um, I've had people offer to, you know, teach me how to <laughs> operate large equipment. I'm like, mm, yes, but not in this tiny alley. Um, but, you know, just really getting to see what people do and how they do it is it's great because everyone takes pride in their work and there's pride in all all work you know there's no job that is truly menial because then it wouldn't exist so it's how do you recognize what they do and their you know their contribution and how they make your organization better because they do you know there's a lot that goes into thought behind hiring jobs so how do you support them and how do you recognize them and how do you make sure they have what they need and then as they're growing you know how, what do you do as in the safety world to encourage them, you know, in a safety sense, at least within the organization. So they look, you know, what else can I do? How, you know, how can I grow here? So I, I really like, you know, as an introvert, it's kind of, <laughs> it always throws people off, but I like those interactions and I like the purpose, the trust and just the consideration that we get and get to give. And then within, you know, more of the risk management side, there's so much potential on what we can do right. You know, right now it's finding the time to do it, but there's so much potential just to really create a consistent, more equitable and inclusive experience for both, you know, uh, employees, but also the residents of the community we live in. So I like the potential. I like the opportunity to help people, which, you know, like it tied into being in medicine, you know, how do you help people? How do you make their lives better? How do you, you know, in, in this privileged world where I work, you know, how do you really actually make this amazing safety program where people, you know, go home in about the same condition they came into work in? If they get the flu, I have a harder time helping them with that. But, you know, overall, right. you're not going to get broken. You're not going to get hurt. You're not going to get assaulted, excluding my law enforcement officers. Um, that's much harder to control. But yeah, how do you just make sure that they have the best possible environment from a safety point of view to, to do what they need to do? Well, that, that actually gives me this, the perfect opportunity to, to ask you, how do you, uh, how do you build a better world through your work and, and how does the law help you inform that? So I'll go to another safety example for the first one. So what we can do as a large employer in our region is we create the expectations on work sites. So we have inspectors who go out and will, if they go into a situation and someone has dug a trench and someone's in it, they'll tell that person to go out and that they're not inspecting anything until the proper equipment's put in. So what we do is we go, because my organization, we meet or exceed OSHA. Most often we exceed OSHA. That kind of hasn't made a what's, lot of changes. What's What's OSHA for the non-Americans? So Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is the federal, uh, U.S. federal program that oversees safety. And it, you know, unless you have a state operated program, which we don't, um, it's the federal government oversees it and it's an enforcement uh, organization. So they're the ones who, if there's serious injuries, if there are complaints, they're the ones who come in and investigate. So they created a set of safety standards that have sort of evolved. They were founded in the 70s. The 80s really saw a lot of um, requirements and they're a little in the 90s and it's really stalled out. I mean, it has to go through the full federal process for rule change, which is slow. So a lot of places will do state programs, which are more progressive. i not in one of those states, but what we, you know, but the, there's still rules you have to enforce that do create a substantially safer environment than if it was just whatever you want to do. So what we do is we come in and we enforce those rules, you know, for small construction companies that may be skirting around and hoping that no one notices what they're up to. If you want our part of it and you need our part of it, because we're going to give you the permit, 
you have to follow these things. So really, we create that expectation in the field for employees. And, you know, we've seen a change. Um, this was something I used to work within our utilities group. We put that expectation in about three and a half years ago. And my inspectors have seen a huge difference. You know, they know that they're coming. They don't have to ask anymore. It is in there. You know, the safety equipment is set up. The stuff is not on the side of a trench. So in making a better world, we're creating that expectation for employers beyond just us. I was, that's exactly what I was about to say. It's mm -hmm. not just that you're, yeah. because you're in government, you're not just fixing your own employer's situation, but you actually have the regulatory power to go out and, and fix uh, fix well, it by, for people yeah. who aren't who aren't in your workplace at all. Yeah. So. so we we create this expectation. If you want what we do, you know, if you want that permit, if you want that inspection, if you want your work to continue, my employees have to have this. So why are you going to waste your time in a scramble? Just do it from the start. So yeah. we have that influence, and we've chosen actively to use that influence, uh, especially with construction. It's you get a lot of smaller places that don't have safety professionals and really don't necessarily know the rules. So more than a punitive thing, it's an educational thing, but it also allows us to state, you know, through action to people who work in this community that we take safety seriously as an organization and as a community and we're going to you know enforce this to the best of our abilities we can't give you fines but my people aren't getting in that trench you know yeah. absolutely not it's 10 feet deep and the walls are going to fall in we all know how fast that kills somebody or unfortunately how slowly it can kill someone but it will yeah. kill you so you know really creating a standard and an expectation that if you're touching our organization, you're going to have to meet this standard in the hope that employees will learn that that actually is what they should expect. And then employers, it's kind of an educational opportunity to realize, well, I have to do it anyway. I might as well just rent the equipment for two weeks instead of the scramble for the two days. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one for us. And then also with our risk management is, you know, we talked about that equity inclusion is creating a much more standard process and then creating education around that. Uh, we are currently installing a new utility in our community and there wasn't a good thought process on how we're gonna handle risk management tasks. So in looking at that, it's how do we communicate what we're gonna do? How do we apply it? How do we make this consistent? and really make sure that the people who need to benefit from this program have that access, have that education, and aren't left with a bill from uh, underground installation. I, I'm, I'm really, this is something that's, that's really fascinating. And we, I, I feel like I could just keep like drawing on the, the threads that you're giving me for hours, but I know that you're, you're busy. This is the, the uh, middle of your work day. So we'll, we'll, move along and, and wrap it, wrap this up. Um, so can you, can you tell us a little bit about how you sort of draw on your own sense of empathy in the work that you do to, to make sure that what you're doing is, is appropriate? So you know, my dad's um, a very slowly retiring doctor and what his specialty is, is burn surgery. And I grew up in New York city and he was the head of the New York hospital burn unit. And I met a lot of people who were burned. I'm probably one of the few people you'll meet who can walk into a burn unit and doesn't gag. But so many of the people I met were there because of their work. And I think that as a kid, you know, you really, you're just like, you know, and, you know, any doctor will tell you the best thing you can do to heal yourself is just not get hurt in the first place. So, you know, in that, the joke, but I mean, it's serious with my family that I'm denying you patients. It's, how do I not do that to someone? How do I not do that to their family? I mean, there is, you know, ultimately in workers' compensation, for most injuries, there is no amount of money you wouldn't give to go back to where you were. And I'm positive that the work comp is not even going to give you close to that amount of money. So in the empathy, it's having seen that, you know, even from a young age and then working, you know, I've worked in healthcare, I've worked for an insurance organization, and now I've worked in government. It's, you know, these people are my coworkers. They're my friends. You know, I know their families. When I look at them, it's how do I ensure you live your life? You know, you don't live to work, you work to live. And my job is really making sure that you have the capacity to do with your life what you want, that, you know, you did not fall off of something and break your shoulder blade and, 
have a concussion and now suddenly your dreams of fly fishing and retirement are gone. It, really what we want is to make sure you can do what you want to do and that you don't fall into that world of you know, having to rethink your entire life because your job choice and your employer and the conditions, you know, all, all factored into just completely altering your life. So to me, there's a lot of satisfaction um, in being able to meet that and to encounter people who, you know, have had that experience, but learn from them and develop from them and really just take care of the people that you're responsible for. So hopefully that answers your question. No, that's, that's fantastic. It, it actually gives me one, one question for a, for a follow-up is, you know, we see sometimes people talking about, um, you know, HR is there to protect the company, not the worker. Um, and, you know, as a former plaintiff's lawyer, I certainly uh, wholeheartedly believe in that in most cases, but like, how do you avoid um pressure or how do you resist pressure to um to act in the organization's interests in a way that's contrary to these these empathetic concerns that you've you've talked about so again i'm fortunate my organization is not quick to fire anyone um but ultimately it's in those conversations is did we really do everything that we needed to do? Can we stand there? And, you know, and that's the nice thing about legal is you're like, are you really going to meet the legal burden to prove that, you know, you didn't maybe miss some of these things? And that's, that's nice, but ultimately it's acting as that person's advocate is this was their condition. You know, we were trying to control these hazards, but you know, what the situation was, was really something we didn't anticipate. This wasn't someone's negligence. This wasn't someone, you know, acting wildly outside their scope of work. There's nothing we can show that this is fireable. And then, you know, in that conversation too, is what do you really gain from that? You know, is this an employee you really want to get rid of? Because if it's not, if you make this pursuit, one, you're just destroying that employee, but you're probably also doing a lot of damage to the morale of that department. And you're doing damage to, you know, how they view the city. But, you know, and this is the thing I'm super protective about is, you know, in taking care of employees, our credibility is safety and risk management is key. You know, if we're seen as kind of narking them out, that destroys any communication we have. They're not going to tell us their safety problems. They're not going to feel comfortable and safe, you know, saying that I didn't do it the right way, but here's why. And we will never have a safety culture that's worthwhile if we don't have that communication. And at this point, the organization I'm in really values that and understands you know, the need for that. I haven't had too many battles on that, <laughs> but I have in other organizations. And some just you know, see people as very replaceable those organizations spend a lot of money on HR and hiring and firing and, you know, they kind of dig their own pit and they tend not to do as well as the organizations that, you know, thoughtfully prioritize their employees as that most important component of the work that they do. Okay. Uh, last question. And then I will let you, you get on with, with your day. And I, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with, with us. Um, uh, where can people get your headphones? So these are Razer Krakens, <laughs> and I think they're the kitty headset, but if you do Razer Kraken headset, they will show up. They're wonderful. I love them. Um, they, I can hear everybody really well. They can hear me, and then I can tune out any ambient noise that may be going on in my home office. Well, and I, the ears are programmable. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I, I thought that was amazing, and that, that, uh, that might be something to, to pass along for anybody who might have some extra pennies in their pocket. So... All right. Well, thank you so much, Claire. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with, with me and to, to help support our, our students on this. And I, I really appreciate that. So thank you. And I know that the students are thankful as well. So. <laughs>